So this is water and its properties and also looking at acid-base balance. To start with, we already know that water is found almost everywhere. The most abundant uh, substance. You can see it makes up the majority of the weight of the organism. In physiology, you know that it will make up when it comes to a man, like 60% of the total body weight in a woman, 55. The attraction between water molecules is the most important factor in which these uh, a lot of reactions are going to be able to operate. Now, the way water is, it has got an oxygen with two hydrogens. So just that means that the charge is going to be different. So the oxygen of water has a negative charge. The hydrogens have got positive charges. So any molecule that has got charges will be able to dissolve in water. And because of that, a lot of chemical reactions happen in water. Water can disassociate. That OH that we can see can get to break off. So what we are saying is we have got we have got this water like that. It can get to break off and then we are going to have an hydroxide and also an hydrogen ion. This is hydroxide, this is hydrogen ion, also known as a proton. But another thing that can happen is that water can react with itself. And what happens is that when an acid and a base reacts, we call an acid as a proton donor. So one of these water molecules will be donating an hydrogen. That's what we call a proton. So one water molecule have H3O. Every time something has got more hydrogens than enough, it carries a positive charge. And then the other one, which has lost the hydrogen, will remain with hydroxide. So in this case, the, this is known as hydronium. It will be the same as a hydrogen. And then here is the hydroxide, which is the same as hydroxide here. So even in calculations involving water, you'll see that where there is hydronium, we can substitute with hydrogen. And vice versa like that. So another thing about water is that it, uh, it is inorganic. Organic compounds are made up of carbon and hydrogen. So because it doesn't have carbon, so it is inorganic. And we already know its chemical formula C, H2O. This hydrogen and oxygen here, this bond that you can see, it's a covalent bond. And the other thing is that water is going to be polar. The meaning of polarity is that it has got opposite charges. So the opposite ends have got opposite charges. You can see this end has got a negative charge and then this other end with the hydrogens is going to have a positive charge. Hydrogen and oxygen atoms, are, is, those are going to create an asymmetric molecule with positive charges on one side and negative charges on the other. It's important to understand this. Water molecule is asymmetric, meaning that it has got, it's something that is metric means that it is equal if you cut it on the middle. But in this case, we're talking about its charges. It is asymmetric. It's not equal because of the charges. On one end, it is positive. On the other end, it is negative. Okay. Another thing to take note is oxygen here is more electronegative than hydrogen. Electronegativity is just the ability to pull electrons in a bond. So because oxygen pulls electrons towards itself, electrons are negatively charged. That's why oxygen ends up being negative. And you can see oxygen has got actually two negative charges because it is pulling electrons from this side. It's also pulling electrons from this side. So because of that, that's why it ends up being negative because of electronegativity. Another important property of water is that it is a universal solvent. We call it universal solvent because almost everything will dissolve in water. Almost everything dissolves in water. And we call it universal solvent because we are referring to 
most of the things that are there are actually polar. And only polar things would dissolve. If we say polar, it means that something has got charges, negative and positive, or it can even be just one charge. So those are the ones which would dissolve in water. Otherwise, anything that doesn't have charges will not dissolve. That's why lipids can dissolve in water. So because of the polarity of water, it will be able to interact with other molecules via hydrogen bonding. It can interact actually with its own, uh, with, with another water molecule. Now what happens is this hydrogen bonds are going to be formed when an hydrogen in one molecule interacts. We know hydrogen is positive. So it interacts with negative things. It can either be oxygen, which is negative, or fluorine, which is negative, or nitrogen. So any compound that has got either nitrogen, fluorine, or oxygen can interact with hydrogen as long as these atoms have got lone pairs of free electrons which can form hydrogen bonds with a hydrogen of water. So you can see in, in a water molecule, one water molecule can form hydrogen bonds with another water molecule. This is the hydrogen bond. Now, hydrogen bonds are weak interactions. You can easily break them. But because a lot of water molecules come together forming hydrogen bonds, even if hydrogen bonds are weak, but because they are a lot, it makes the hydrogen bonds in water to be strong. So when you are boiling water, what you're actually breaking are hydrogen bonds. You don't break covalent bonds. Because when you break covalent bonds, it means you are going to convert water into the gases which made it up. Now, when you are breaking hydrogen bonds, you convert water from one state to another, from a liquid to a, to a gas or from a solid into a liquid. Other molecules, as long as they have got, as long as they have got the same atoms that we've described can form hydrogen bonds. Look at this one. Here you have got, this is a water molecule. It is interacting with another water molecule, which is there. Those are hydrogen bonds. But then you can have anything that has got an hydrogen with those other three atoms we mentioned. For example, I've got hydrogen fluoride here. The fluorine can interact with the hydrogen from another hydrogen fluoride. And this is a covalent bond. Same here, we have got ammonia. The nitrogen of ammonia has got a lone pair. It can attract the hydrogen of water. So those are all hydrogen bonds. Another thing is that we've already mentioned that hydrogen bonds are weak. So water as a high melting point and boiling point and also the heat of vaporization because of the same hydrogen bonds. Actually, most of the compounds are going to have a lower melting point, lower boiling point, lower heat of vaporization in comparison to water. Just because of a lot of hydrogen bonds that water forms. Each water molecule can bond to a maximum of four neighboring water molecules. This is important. One water molecule can bond to a maximum of four water molecules around it when it is forming those hydrogen bonds. Now let me just describe something about what we've mentioned. The Okay, I think we'll talk about it in front. Carbon atoms now, carbon atoms in comparison to the hydrogen and the oxygen, these ones will not participate, do not participate in hydrogen bonding. That is because carbon atoms have got a lower electronegativity. So the electronegativity difference, when you have got a bond between carbon and hydrogen, the electronegativity difference between this and this is small. In other words, carbon doesn't have that capacity to pull electrons away from the hydrogen. So when carbon reacts with hydrogen, the molecule is not polar. So because it's not polar, it can't form hydrogen bonds. That is why hydrocarbons, things like methane, ethane, those are going to be non-polar because of these bonds. Water will readily dissolve a lot of biomolecules, which have got charges. So those compounds which can dissolve in water, referred to as hydrophilic, those which cannot dissolve, hydrophobic. So a lot of compounds which have got a carbon bonded to a hydrogen, those are hydrophobic, so they can dissolve in water. 
The charges associated with polar molecules form hydrogen bonds with water surrounding the particle with the water molecule. So this, that is known as the sphere of hydration. What will happen is this. Imagine you have got sodium. Sodium is positively charged. What will happen is that water will surround this sodium, but the negative part of water, which is the oxygen, it is the one which will surround the sodium. So a lot of them like this. A lot and a lot of them. So this is what forms what is known as a sphere of hydration. And this will keep the particles dispersed in water. So in ca let's say we had sodium chloride. The sodium is going to be surrounded by water like that. The chlorine, also the chloride ion. Now in this case, it's the positive part of water, which is the hydrogen, that will be closer to the chloride. So it will also be surrounded. So because of this, Sodium and chlorine cannot come together. And we say they have been dissolved. That is why compounds get to be dissolved in water because of the formation of spheres of hydration. So this is what we are talking about, what we can see here. You can see this chlorine has been surrounded, the sodium has been surrounded, and just like that. So this can also be applied to charged bowel molecules. Compounds which have got, for example, a carboxylic acid functional group, protonated amines and phosphate groups, they all can be surrounded by water just like the sodium chloride can be surrounded by water like that. Amphiphatic compounds are compounds which are going to be polar. They are going to have some regions which are polar and regions which are non-polar. Meaning that if we say a compound is amphiphatic, it means that it is both water-loving and water-hating. So it is both hydrophilic and hydrophobic. So the parts when you dissolve such a compound in water, uh, the common example that you can give is a phospholipid where the head is polar and then the tails are non-polar. So the heads which are polar will be attracted to water, the tails which are non-polar will be away from the water. Okay, so that is what happens. So because of that, these will be able to form what we call missiles. You are going to have, they can actually surround water. Imagine you have got, okay, imagine you have got this compound like a phospholipid, and then you put it in water. What will happen is that the heads will come together. The, I'll write the long ones will represent the tails. The heads will come together. The tails will be like aggregating. The tails aggregate, so the heads are more like protecting themselves, so the heads will be covered inside. Such that even when the environment has got water, the tails which are non-polar will, will not be able to interact with water. So that is what is known as a missile, just this formation that we can see here. The forces that hold non-polar regions of the molecule together are known as hydrophobic interactions. So these non-polar regions, which you can see inside there, they are being held together by hydrophobic interactions. So this is what we can, this is what we are talking about. This is the formation of a missile. The non-polar regions go in inside like that. Okay. Many biomolecules are amphiphatic, meaning they are both hydrophobic and hydrophilic. And examples we can talk about proteins, pigments, vitamins, sterols, phospholipids, and a lot of just membrane proteins. These are going to be all amphiphatic. Hydrophobic interactions among lipids and between lipids and proteins are the most important feature of structure structures in bi biological membranes. So if you have got Let's say this is the cell membrane. Because the cell membrane is made up of things which are non-polar. They only interact because of hydrophobic interactions. Unless some parts which are polar, those can interact with hydrophilic interactions. Otherwise, the most important interaction is hydrophobic in biological membranes. Hydrophobic interactions between non-polar amino acids also are going to be able to stabilize the 3D structures. So what happens, and we'll, we'll talk about 
it will be there another topic proteins we'll see these hydrophobic interactions they'll be able to hold the 3d structures of these proteins now we talk about water properties the first property of water specific heat of water so the specific heat of water is high remember this question came in in the exam for last year. what is the specific heat of water specific heat is the amount of heat that must be absorbed or lost for one gram of a substance to change its temperature let's say if water is at 26 degrees you want it to go to 27 degrees you are increasing the the temperature by one degree that heat that you need to be able to add to water for it to change from 26 to 27 is what we call specific heat now specifically specific heat we are talking about one gram of water so the amount of heat that we add to one gram of water to change the temperature by one degree is what we know we call specific heat so if we remove one gram we just say the amount of heat that we have to add to water to change the temperature by one degree that is known as heat capacity not specific heat capacity just heat capacity heat is just the total amount of kinetic energy okay just the amount of kinetic energy temperature is the measure of intensity so for example i can be talking about a light source like this one this one is going to be producing so the light source has got energy that form of energy it has is what we are calling as heat now this amount this energy can move from one region to another so where heat is high to where heat is low so that is now what we refer to as temperature just the intensity of heat how high or low heat is water will be able to resist changes in the temperature why because the specific heat of water is high the meaning of that is for me to change the temperature of water just from 26 to 27 or from 24 to 25 it needs a lot of heat to be added meaning that as long as i'm adding heat and it is below the specific heat any heat that i add the temperature will not be able to change okay temperature will not be able to change and this can all be explained because of hydrogen bonding water has got a lot of hydrogen bonds so for you to be able to break all those hydrogen bonds you are going to add a lot of heat before you can break the water molecule so the abundance of water in the cells and tissue of all large multicellular organisms means that temperature fluctuations within are going to be minimized this is very important imagine most of the chemical reactions remember we talk about the body has got a lot of enzymes and enzymes work at an optimum pH meaning that if you go beyond or too too low uh, when you're talking about the optimum pH some enzymes can either be inactive or denatured so cells have got a lot of water so that even if you increase your it is very hot the temperature will not be able to change even if it is very cold the temperature will not be able to change very much so the importance of specific heat capacity is to prevent temperature fluctuations or temperature changes and that is important because it will maintain the environment for biological reactions to be able to happen because biological reactions are sensitive to temperature and water will be able to absorb and store a lot of heat from the sun with the slight changes in temperature meaning that let's say water is at one degree for it just to change to two degrees it has to to absorb a lot of heat so meaning it can store a lot of heat but the temperature is not really changing so even for it to lose heat for it to be able to lose that heat it will just it will lose a lot of heat but then it has just changed in a small temperature then that will be another property to talk about 
So for water to decrease in temperature, water molecules must move more slowly. This requires formation of hydrogen bonds. Formation of hydrogen bonds gives the heat off. As a result, the air around the cooling water becomes warm. So imagine you are sweating. Huh? If someone has to sweat, you, are, you want to release water. But for you to be able to release that water, you have to, to be able to change the temperature. Now remember, for you just to release water, it means you have broken hydrogen bonds. Right? You are losing the water as heat. When you are losing the water as heat, uh, I mean you are losing the water as vapor, you will not be able to see the sweat. So in this case, when you are forming the sweat, you, you are going to see you are forming actually water molecules because what you see is water. You are actually forming water. That is the actual water that you see as sweat. So the formation of those hydrogen bonds it requires a lot of heat for you to be able to form them. And you are going to be able to lose that water to the outside and that will cool your body because as we are forming that water to remove from the body you are actually taking a lot of heat away from your body and that is what leads to the cooling effect and then the heat of vaporization for water is also high the heat of vaporization is just the amount of heat energy that you need to convert one gram of a substance to a liquid of a liquid to a gaseous form Let's say I've got liquid water, one gram of it, you want to change it to gas. That amount of heat that you need to convert the liquid water to gaseous water is called the heat of vaporization. And because of the same hydrogen bonds, water, for it to be able to break the bonds in water, the hydrogen bonds in water, you need a lot of heat. Because if you break those hydrogen bonds, you, conv you convert a liquid into a gas. So by the time you're converting the liquid into a gas, you would have what? You would have used a lot and a lot of heat energy. So as the liquids evaporate, the remaining surface is going to cool. And this is important in what is called the cooling effect. Okay, cooling effect. When it is very hot, we can, this is how we also get to be cooled up when we are sweating. As you are sweating, you are releasing some water in terms of vapor and it leaves your body cooled because you have lost a lot of heat for you just to remain like that. That is because of heat of vaporization. To remove water, you need to remove a lot of heat from the body and so you get to be cooled. Okay, so that is about water. Is there any question on that? Okay, now we talk about acids and bases. An acid is a compound that has got hydrogen ions. So any compound that will be increasing hydrogen ions in solution is an acid. A base is any compound that will be increasing hydroxide ions in, in solution. We can also say an acid is actually any compound that will donate an hydrogen. And then a base is any compound that will accept an hydrogen. So atoms can gain or lose electrons to form ions. So when an atom gains or loses electrons to form an ion, that is known as ionization. For example, let's say you have got sodium, which is a metal. It loses an electron, it becomes sodium ion. So this is known as ionization. It has formed an ion because of the loss or gain of electrons. Now, when you get, say, sodium chloride, you dissolve it in water. What will happen is that it will break into sodium ion and chloride ion. Now, the formation of ions after you dissolve something in water, that is known as dissociation. The formation of ions, when it gains when a compound gains or loses electrons, it's called ionization. Okay, so those are two different terms. Water itself can disassociate. We know that water, we already talked about this, water is like this. 
one water molecule can donate a proton to another and so you form H3O plus and then the other one remains as hydroxide. So water can disassociate. In other words, water can dissolve in water. Remember, disassociation has to do with dissolving in something, isn't it? So what can happen is that when water is in water, it doesn't make sense. Huh? So what can happen is that an hydrogen can be removed and then you remain with hydroxide. So this is known as a disassociation of water. So the disassociation of water will produce hydrogen ions and the hydroxide ions. But remember we said hydrogen is the same as hydronium. So hydronium and hydroxide, those are the molecules that water will produce after it undergoes disassociation. So this is what we have just talked about. You have got water, it disassociates to form hydroxide and hydrogen. And we said hydronium is the same as hydrogen ion. When you change the concentration of hydrogen and hydroxide for water, that is going to be able to change the chemistry of a cell. Because the measurement of hydrogen and the measurement of hydroxide determines what we call pH and pOH. When you increase hydrogen, you are making something more acidic. When you increase hydroxide, you are making something more basic. You can measure the acidity and the basicity of a compound using a pH scale. An acid is anything that will increase hydrogen and the base is anything that will increase hydroxide. So pH itself is just a measure of acidity or alkalinity of a solution. Every time you are talking about P of something, let's say I'm talking about X. If I get P, I put on X, it means negative log of that X. If I'm talking about P, I put P in front, it means that it will be negative log of that P. So if I'm talking about H, which is the hydrogen, I put a P in front, it means it will be negative log of that hydrogen. So therefore, the pH of a solution is given by negative log of the concentration of the hydrogen. Remember I said the concentration of hydrogen is the same as the concentration of the hydroxide. So the pH is going to be negative log of the concentration of hydronium. So if we have got hydroxide, we put a P. pOH then is going to be negative log of the concentration of OH. This square brackets mean concentration. Now, for, for pure water at, at room temperature, 25 degrees Celsius, the concentration of hydroxide is the same as the concentration of hydrogen. And that is 1 times 10 to the power negative 7. Meaning if we find the pOH and the pH to be negative log of this number, 1 times 10 to the power negative 7, and that will give us a 7. So pH is 7 for pure water and pOH is also 7 for pure water. If we add pH and pOH, we are going to get 14. And that number that we form is known as pKW. So when water is disassociating to form hydrogen and hydroxide, it has got a disassociation constant and we call it the disassociation constant for water. The disassociation constant for water, if we add a P in front of it, becomes PKW. So PKW is negative log of KW. Because water can act both as an acid and as a base, you can see it's, PK, it's disassociation constant expressed with a P. PKW will be the sum of the disassociation constant for an acid and the disassociation constant for a base. Low values correspond to a high concentration of hydrogen. So what we are saying is that if pH is low, let me go on the next, okay, can you use just the same one? When we have got a high concentration of hydrogen, this means that what the compound we're talking about is an acid. If hydrogen concentration is high, it means that pH 
is going to be also high. Now, this is just the opposite of what I'm mentioning. So pardon me on that one. If a, if a compound has got a high concentration, look at a pH scale from 7 to 14, then from 7 going down to 1. So the closer you go to 1, the more acidic. It means that you're having a lot of hydrogens. So what does that mean? When you have got a high concentration of hydrogen, you are going to have a low concentration. You are going to have a low pH. When you have got a high pH, high pH means you are towards 14, meaning that you are basic. So high pH means you have got a low concentration of hydrogen. So acidic solutions have pH values less than 7. And then basic greater than 7. Most biological fluids in the body, their pH is between 6 and 8. This is most likely neutral pH for biological solutions. Strong acids and strong bases will talk about those compounds which can disassociate in water completely. Now, a strong acid is different from a concentrated acid. A strong acid, let's say, for example, I'm talking about HCl. HCl, if it is disassociated, it will completely disassociate to give you hydrogen ions and chloride ions. But if I talk about hydrogen fluoride, when this one disassociates, it doesn't completely disassociate. It will remain, some of it will remain as hydrogen fluoride. So this one is, is actually a weak base. I mean a weak acid. So weak acids, an example you can give is acet acetate. Weak bases, an example you can give is ammonia. So these ones will partially disassociate or partially ionize. The strength of an acid or a base will, de will depend on how much it disassociates. The more it disassociates, the stronger the acid. In other words, if you're talking about hydro hydrochloric acid, how easily can it release hydrogen? Compounds which can easily let go of the hydrogen, we call them strong acids. So this can easily let go of the hydrogen and then it remain as a Cl. And then those which can't easily let go, they are weak acids. In order to quantify, you, are, you want to determine how weak or how strong an acid is, you can use it the Ka. K is the equilibrium uh, constant. A is representing acid, so that is equilibrium constant of an acid. And remember we said, so for an acid, an acid we can generally write it in the form HA. A can be anything. For example, a chlorine, it becomes hydrochloric acid, fluorine, hydrofluoric acid. If this one disassociates, you are going to form hydrogen ions, and A minus like that. So in this case, because it's an acid which is disassociating, we can find the acid disassociation constant. When the acid disassociation constant is high, it means that that acid is a strong acid. Now remember we said if you have got anything, if you put P in front of it, it becomes negative log of that thing. So I can actually find pKa, which is going to be negative log of Ka. So pKa is negative log of Ka. P of anything is opposite to that same thing. So if we're talking about pKa, the higher the pKa will correspond to low Ka. If we are saying a strong acid, has got a high Ka. It means that its pKa should be low. Okay, that's the meaning. So the larger the value of the Ka, the stronger the acid. Since the acid has largely disassociated. Ka, remember, is the acid disassociation constant. So K is related to disassociation. If it is the base, we'll talk about Kb. Kb is the best disassociation constant. So you can also find pKb, which is negative log of Kb. So pKa is the number that shows how weak or strong an acid is. 
but Ka itself is showing how much the acid disassociates. Pka is showing how strong or weak the acid is. So if you are comparing two acids, let's say one acid has got a pKa which is a 3.8. Another one has got a pKa which is 4.7. The one which is stronger should have a low pKa. So the one with a lower pKa is a stronger acid than the one with a higher pKa. Look at this example. Acetic acid is a weak acid with an acid dissociation constant of 4. 1.8 times 10 to negative 5. What would be the pKa? So pKa is given by negative log of Ka, so that will be negative log of 1.8 times 10 to the power negative 5. That will give us 4.74 direct like that. We can relate the pH of an acid to the pKa by the Henderson Hassel Bosch equation. If you remember the Question came to say, write the Henderson Hassel Bosch equation in biochemistry for last. So, we should be able to also de derive the Henderson Hassel Bosch equation. Now, the first thing is when you have got an acid, we said an acid is in the general form HA. This can be, can disassociate, and then you are going to form HA plus A minus. When you compare two compounds which differ by one proton, this one and this one, they only differ by one proton. Proton we refer to a hydrogen. So those we call them conjugates of each other. So HA and A minus, these are conjugates of each other. When you're talking about conjugates of each other, they should always differ by one proton. Anything more than that, they're not conjugates. For example, I can talk about sulfuric acid and this ion. If it if the sulfuric acid loses one hydrogen, every time time something is losing an hydrogen, it will becoming negative. If it is gaining an hydrogen, it will becoming more positive. These are conjugates of each other. But if I write sulfuric acid and then SO, sorry, I should have put a four there. SO for two minus. It has lost two hydrogen, so the charge has become two minus. These are not conjugates of each other because they don't differ by one proton. So they should differ by one proton. So compounds that differ by one proton are conjugates. And when you are comparing them, the one with the hydrogen is always the acid. So this will be the acid. And then this other one is going to be the base. Now from our acid disassociation constant, when you are finding the Ka, Ka acid disassociation constant is given as the concentration on the product side. So on the product side, we have got hydrogen ion, and then we have got A minus, divided by the concentration on the reactant side, and on the reactant, we have got HA. So at this point, I can actually even split this, but remember we talked about P, P of something. We said P of something is negative log of that thing. So I'll introduce negative log both sides. So I'm going to have negative log of Ka, being equal to negative log of, but what I'll do here is I'll put the HA, the H alone, and then I'll put now the A minus over HA. It is the same thing. I've not changed anything. Now, remember we said negative log of something is actually the P of that same thing. So this will be PKA, and this will be equal to, according to the law, uh, laws of logarithms, when you have got log of A, B, you can also write this as log of A plus log of B. So same way with this one, we have got a negative. But if I attach a negative in front here, it means that it will be negative log of A minus log of B. So I've got negative log of H and A minus over HA. So this will be negative log of H and then negative log of A minus over HA. So then this gives us PKA being equal to negative log, negative log of H. Remember we said negative log of anything is P of that thing. So negative log of H is going to be PH. And then minus log of A minus 
divided by HA. This point, I can take this term the other side so that I make pH subject the formula. So pH therefore will be equal to pKa. This term will go the other side so that will be plus log of A minus divided by HA. Now remember we said the A minus was actually the base, the HA was the acid. So you can also say log of base over acid. So this one is what we call the Anderson Hassel Bosch equation. pH is going to be given by pKa plus log of the. Now this one is not just a base, but we call it a conjugate base because it is coming from an acid. But if we had an acid, let's say we had an acid like this, it gained an hydrogen and then it went into HA. So this, we started with the base first and then we formed an acid. So this acid will be the conjugate acid of this base. So pH is pKa plus log of o, base over acid. Okay, so that is how you get that one. You can use an example. Calculate the pH of a buffer solution made from 0.20 molar, so this was supposed to be 0 0.20 molar of H C2 H3 O2 and 0 0.50 molar of this was supposed to be H2 CH C2 H3 O2 with a minus okay, that has a pKa, they've given us also the pKa for the acid as 4.7 so if you've been given a the acid and this conjugate base and the pKa, you can use the anderson hassel bosch equation. pH is equal to pKa plus log of o. This is the base. This is the acid, over the acid. Why have I said this is the base? Remember we say the base has always fewer hydrogens than the acid, and this one has got fewer hydrogens. So the pKa is 4.7 plus log. The base is this one with fewer hydrogen, the concentration is 0 0.5 over the concentration of the acid is 0 0.2. So that will give us a pH of 5.1. Is that okay? Okay. So this is an, another example that can be tried. A buffer solution contains 0 0.5 molar acetic acid and 0 0.5 molar sodium acetate. Calculate the pH. They've given us the Ka inside there. So that was supposed to be 1.8 times 10 to the power negative 5 there. So look at what we've been given. We've been given acetic acid, which is H2C2H3O2. And then its concentration is 0 0.5 mole. We've also been given sodium acetate. Its concentration is 0 0.5 also. We know that pH is equal to pKa plus log concentration of the base over the concentration of the acid. So in this case, the pKa, the pKa is, they have given us the Ka, so meaning we don't know the pKa. Okay. So to know the pKa, we know that is given by negative log of the Ka. So that would be negative log of 1.8 times 10 to the power negative 5, and then plus log. Now the base is the one with fewer hydrogens. The base is always the one with fewer hydrogens. So it's supposed to be just an hydrogen. So this one, the sodium, sodium is positively charged. So instead of us writing the acetate ion as C2, H3O2 minus. We just attach a sodium there so that it will not be something negatively charged. Sodium will not affect any reaction. So that is 0 0.5, 0 over 0 0.5, 0. So this is what we punch in the calculator. So the answer that we found, that will be our pH. Okay, so that is the first part.